The good thing about Congolese music is that in its evolutionary process, it has stood the test of time from rumba to sukus to kwasa kwasa, ndombolo, and today with what Fali Pupa, Feregola, and the hosts of the guys who are leading Congolese music are doing, the music has stood firm and it's appreciated worldwide. I said one time that um, Congo is to music like Brazil is to football. And so that is um, what it is, and we keep appreciating Congolese music. And of course, music that comes from other parts of Africa. Someone also said that the Black Race produces 93% of music that is consumed worldwide, but only rips 5% of um, proceeds from music. That is so bad. Okay, we shall be talking about um, money made in music or resources of um, uh, money from music in today's edition of African Fiesta. That will be with uh, analyst Solomon Atta, who will be joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa. And lots of other items will be present in today's edition of African Fiesta. African Fiesta is the show that comes up right ahead on Apex One Radio. Once again, good morning and welcome to Apex One Radio. It's Saturday, the 6th of April, 2018. It's a bright Saturday here in the city of Columbus. I don't know what the situation is at your own corner of the world, but I presume that it's a fantastic Saturday. Thank God it's weekend and you can now relax. Exactly 21 minutes past 10 here in the studio, same time in Maryland, where we have lots of listeners of Apex One Radio. And in the studio, I have two beautiful and committed young Africans here who make the continent tick in their respective ways. They are familiar to Apex One Radio. And so I'm going to begin uh, with Magidesi, who will be hosting African Fiesta with me. So how was the week? And that a perfect one? Uh, no, no, it rains. And when it rains, it's not perfect. But as usual, I'm glad it's Saturday because I get to be here on African Fiesta, only on Apex One Radio. Would you prefer snow to rain? I don't prefer either of them. I just want it to be sunshine. I want everything to be rosy and cheerful. Unfortunately, we cannot have sunshine <laughs> all year round. We can hope. <laughs> <laughs> that cannot happen because you're talking about nature and nature doesn't change like that. I know, it? but we can still hope, can't we? Well, um, there's nothing as big as having hopes there. Um, <laughs> if you lose everything, I think the last thing that should stay on your plate is hope. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, that is how it's going to look like today on Apex One Radio. African Fiesta number 99 and is next. Are you ready? I'm ready. She's always ready. Our studio guest is ready. She is right here. You will discover her when she comes on the airways. You're not going to discover her PC because she is not unfamiliar to this platform. But for now, I think it's time to start. Let's do this. All right, African Fiesta 99, let's go. A tree, you must climb down the same tree. If you climb up a tree, you must climb down the same tree. A cutting word is worse than a bowstring. A cut may heal, but the cut of the tongue does not. A cutting word is worse than a bowstring. A cut may heal but the cut of the thong does not Go. 
Good morning, America. Good afternoon, Africa. And welcome to the 99N edition of African Fiesta, reaching you from Apex One Radio. African Fiesta is the radio way of celebrating Africa in the continent's socioeconomic and cultural life. So how, so how much of Africa do you know in terms of geography, history, politics, economics, culture, tourism, sports, cuisine, I mean listeners, you name them. How much of African music do you listen to and dance to? How much of African meals do you consume and enjoy? These are the kinds of questions we do well to answer just on African Fiesta. Fiesta brings African values on the platform and presents them to the rest of the world. And in this 99N edition of the show... Thus is yet to settle on the fashion show for women with disabilities, which took place last weekend in Yawunde, Organized by the advocacy organization Sister Speak, the show came at a time women the world over had just commemorated the International Women's Day. It also came at a time women are facing numerous sociopolitical and economic problems. On the show today, Wancha Cynthia, who played a great role at that event as MC, comes back to it and in her report, she paints a picture of access as the show was dubbed. Cynthia will be speaking live from Bamenda and we shall also listen to the organizer, Komi Musa, in this edition of the show. First profile today, we zoom on Chinoso Sonchin, a Cameroonian actor based in Douala. Chinoso has featured in a couple of movies as an actor, but has also worked in many productions as a makeup artist. So, for how long has she been in the movies? What was her inspiration? How does, how does she jack in all acting and makeup and succeed in the two? Answers to these questions and more will be yours when the multi-talented artist joins us on the show. She's one of our guests in the 99th edition of African Fiesta. Does music fetch money these days? Big question at a time, many more musicians and music tracks are popping up. Answers only in this edition of African Fiesta, reaching you from Apex One Radio. And also in today's edition of African Fiesta, we will be talking to the producer of Mad Man, which is a movie that is at the verge of being made public. Akuru Rafael is his name. He'll be speaking live from Bermenda. Then the Ege show is up and coming. The host of that show will be joining us from Texas in this edition of the show. When she comes on the airways, the story of that great show will be told. Then Sharon Dione will join us from Limbe for a runoff of culture news this past couple of days and also we will be having uh kb our reporter in boya for news from that and just in this edition of the show but we have a special guest here in the studio who has flown all the way from baltimore maryland to the studio of apex one radio to tell the story of her career she is an actress she is a film writer, she is a producer, even though she doesn't want to be described <laughs> as such. But then, um, Lily Asako Jackson, Everything and Masters, 
all of what she does. She's not unfamiliar to Apex One Radio. She's done a couple of things with us. But then she comes to the studio today in her capacity as the producer of two very interesting short films that are out there circulating already. At exactly 10.30, let's say welcome to our special guest. Liz, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. So how was the flight from Baltimore to Columbus? It was beautiful. I slept the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> but that was just over one and a half hours, if not less. Because I flew from DCA. If I flew from BWI, which is the mm -hmm. airport in Baltimore, it would... It would have been a mess because she had to ah. connect flights. But I went to DCA, which is Reagan, mm -hmm. and it was a direct flight, one hour and some minutes. It wasn't up to 30. Beautiful. Yeah. So, but you've rested enough. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> when I got home, I slept some more. All right. So she's rested <laughs> enough, ready to tell the story of... Um, one thing about Lydis is she is uh, one of the rare Africans who, who, who studied at the famous New York Film Academy. And um, we've hardly had Africans who've been to this prestigious film school. Mm -hmm. And we're going to use that opportunity to know more about it. Um, a lot of people get into films, and um, it's true. Um, some of the best people in, in, in the industry didn't go to film school. But going to a film school is also an uh, advantage, I guess. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. So, Lily Sasaka will be telling us all of that in today's edition of African Fiesta. Lily, once again, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank all right. You. So, uh, first things first, let's bow down our heads and say thank you, God, in a word of prayer. We do that every every week because um, it's just something we cannot explain when we come on radio and we are able to put up a great production like this one. So, if you are listening to us at this moment, wherever you are around the world, just bow down your heads for a moment. Let's uh, say thank you, God. We're going to join in the company of Kanda Bongoman. And Nene Chaku in Yesu Christo, Congolese gospel music. Let's go. piece of Congolese music reminding us to be thankful for everything that we have, to be 
be thankful for this opportunity that has been provided to us to come here every Saturday and do what we love and bring entertainment and more music to our listeners. Father, we do not take this opportunity for granted because we know that there's so many more people out there who would love to be where we are. We continue praying for everyone who listens to Apex One Radio far and wide. We pray, Lord, that you will shower your blessings upon them and to give us the gift and the strength and the courage to do what we love every week. Amen. Amen. Let me talk who I can uh, that beautiful piece of Congolese gospel music, which has brought a time to 23 minutes to 11 years in the studio of Apex One Radio. We are broadcasting from the United States of America. We are in the state of Ohio, precisely the city of Columbus, and it's Saturday, the 6th of April, 2019. Once again, welcome on board this edition of African Fiesta, produced from Vasuch in Switzerland by Marcel Adig, monitored by the entire Apex One Radio team and hosted in the studio by two of us. There is Maggie Daisy and Mr. Enes Kanjo. Lily Sasakwa is our guest. In today's edition of the show, she is the producer of two short films which um, were done in the space of just six months, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, one of those short films has a very interesting title, Once Upon a Wish. Yeah. <laughs> Each time I come across that title, like, I just I just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lilis will be explaining that to us. But before then, once again, welcome, Lilis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lilis, welcome to FX1 Radio yes. Studio here in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you. Absolutely. It's always exciting to stop by here, listen to FX1 Radio. This is home, so. Mm. <laughs> We're glad you think this is home. So before we start talking about Once Upon a Wish, there's some people out there listening to us right now who don't really know much about you. Mm -hmm. Who is Lily Asakwa? Where did you grow up? Lily Asakwa is the fifth of six kids from the village of Ngi in Bamenda, Cameroon. Uh, I was actually born in um, Bamenda Central Hospital, and I give it up for Bamenda. <laughs> <laughs> Bamenda, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> before b before she continues, she likes to describe herself as a village girl. Why? Um, I feel like I can relate more to being that towards that, and and it's funny because I grew up here, mm -hmm. but I don't feel. You know, I'm not this high maintenance, high class. You've not a Qatarai. Yeah, I hey. would rather carry my country bag than the Gucci bag. You know, <laughs> I'm just, I don't know what it is, but, I, you know, I'm a village girl all day, so. <laughs> so you say you grew up here. When did you officially relocate to the United States? I came in 2007, March 2007. 
and I've been here since I haven't been back home, but I'm still a village wow. girl. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are some people listening to us who would question <laughs> that. Yeah. Now, you've said you're a village girl, but besides describing yourself as a village girl, what other adjectives would you use to describe Nidhi? Um, You know, I am a passionate filmmaker. I'm also a nurse. I love food. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Do you love Cameroonian food? I love food. Like. Ooh. That's no, but still, I'm a picky eater, even though I love food. Mm. Mm. It's complicated. Like, I love food, but it needs to be something I'm familiar with. Like, yeah. rice is rice. It doesn't matter what else you add to the rice. It's still rice, yeah, so I'll rice. eat it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Lilis Asakwe from a remote village somewhere <laughs> in the middle of Cameroon. Ngi. Ngi. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Living here in the United States. Ms. Akajo was saying earlier that you went to film school. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit more about that. What was the um, motivating factor, so to speak, that had you making the decision to pursue acting and actually go to school for it? I think um, my whole life I've always been curious about film and being in the village. My sister used to take me to the film hall um, every market day. Mm. So I would be so curious. I was so little. I didn't understand that those are just shadows of people. I'm just like, oh my God, how did they get in that thing? And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there was a film at the time, it's like about a Nigerian film. And mm. I felt like I could smell the blood in the room. And I was just so curious mm. about it. So, um, I thought I was going to go to Nigeria to be a Nollywood actress, and I ended up here. My mom brought me, and I wanted to do film so much, but yeah. being that we are here, you got to secure a future first. So yes. they felt like I had to do something that's more promising. Not necessarily more promising, but something that you know that when you're done Oop. with it, you're going to, you know, mm. see money. Income. Something that's guaranteed, basically. Yes. Yes. Because And so I, in high school, I was doing a lot of healthcare-related classes. Then I went into nursing, but I knew that that's not my calling. Um, <laughs> 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 that is not my calling. Uh, so I wanted to get into film so bad. I was so lost, so naive. It's not like nursing where you go to school, you graduate, take state board, you start working. This is yes. different. This has no manual, you no know, direction. You just so I wanted to get into acting so bad I didn't know how to. So I was just Googling film school and New York Film Academy was one of the main ones that popped up and I was like yeah. I'm gonna go to this school and that's how all that came about. So for me, it was just a way to get into the industry or to figure out how to get into the industry. Mm-hmm. I actually got into the film school. I, the rest of the story will be told just in this edition of Apex One. Radio's African Fiesta. Lily Sasakwa is the guest in today's edition of the show. She is live in the studio. We're going to speak with um, a lot of other people, including Solomon Atta, who will be joining us from South Africa to tell us about the source of music, many, and just why we have so many musicians nowadays, but uh, little money. All right, so uh, let's do some music and see who we are going to have first, Maggie Daisy.
Again, Ganda Moa by Jackie Bio Makosa, artist power excellence. We have spent the time to 13 minutes to 11 here in the studio of Apex One Radio. And so, in the next couple of days or weeks, depending on what the um, producer of that film will tell us, Matman will see the light of day. It's produced and directed by uh, Akuro Rafael, who now joins us from Bamenda for the rest of the story. Akuro, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, NS Kanjo. It's, uh, it's an honor to be on the show today. All right. So you're welcome. And like I mentioned earlier on, you are the producer of Madman, which is at the verge of being made public. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Now, uh, Raphael, would you say that Madman has already been shot, edited, and we're only waiting for it to be released? Come again. Has Madman been shot and edited, and we're only waiting for the release? Yeah, the Madman has been short, edited, and edited. So it's only what is pending now is the the release of it. Mm -hmm. And do you have a release date yet? No, not yet. Presently, uh, we're also submitting it to festivals. Okay. Now, yeah. What we're, we're talking about Madman, but for our listeners out there who don't really know what this movie is about, can you give us a brief synopsis? Come again. I the line is kind of breaking. Where was this movie shot? The movie was shot on location in Yaoundé. Mm, okay. And um, what character do you? Uh, what 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 role do you play in this production? Uh, I happen to be the writer, producer, and writer, one of the producers and the director of the movie. Ah, you're wearing many caps, huh? Hello? You're wearing many caps in the movie, or many hats? <laughs> uh, kind of. I co-produced the movie with a colleague based in the USA, Harry Peace, and uh, I directed the movie. I also happen to be the writer. Okay. What, yeah. Who are some of the people that you had to work with on this production? And what was that experience like for you? The line is quite breaking. Can you come again, please? Yes. Um, I'm asking on behalf of myself and on behalf of our listeners who some of the actors are that you had to work with and what your experience was working with uh, the various people on the cast. Okay, uh, I will say, uh, well, let me start by the characters, the PD actors that uh, participated in the movie The Mad Man. Uh, we have uh, the renowned Libota McDonald that participated, act, uh, played the role of uh, 
Dr. Raphael, and we have uh, Yannick Dominus. He played the role of uh, Dr. Frank. We have uh, Ngonga Elizabeth, Elizabeth that played the role of uh, Mamiche. And we have Bank Banta that played the role of uh, Che. And we have the madman himself, which I... I, will, I wanted to keep it as a secret, but the name is Prince O.J. Prince O.J. It's a, a good method, yeah, a good method actor, Prince O.J. He, he is the madman. Mm. And so, uh, with all this uh, vast uh, cast that you had, what was the storyline? Okay, uh, the storyline is, uh, I, well, I would say I am one person... One crazy kind of writer, let me put it that way. I normally think out of uh, the box, just think out of my comfort zone, trying to believe in the uh, the unbelievable in the eyes of many, many other persons. I just look at things differently. So the storyline happens to be uh, the lock line, let me put it this way. The lock line is all about what would you do if you are being faced with a deadly situation and the only option you have is to trust a madman. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds so, exciting already. I hope people go out there and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a kind of a story that on a day-to-day, -day you get people, you ask somebody, can you trust a madman? Hmm. You say, how can I trust a madman? Hmm. What if you're being faced with a deadly situation? Can you trust a madman? No, I can't trust a madman. But in this movie, it tells the, the detailed story how somebody gladly and willingly trusts a madman, mm -hmm. believing that everything will be possible. Intriguing story there in the Madman movie produced by Akuro Rafael, whose life on Apex One Radio in this edition of African Fiesta reaching you from Columbus, Ohio, in the United States of America, show produced by Maxel Ajayan, hosted by Ernest Kanjo Ayn. Maggie Daisy. Melissa Sakura is still the guest in today's edition of the show. She's like here, live in the studio of Apex One Radio. Now, Melissa Sakura, would you trust a madman? <laughs> I'll be very skeptical. I, I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> Although they always say, though, that a madman always knows what they are saying. But I, I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, back to you, uh, Raphael. Will, yeah. Can you tell our listeners why they should go out and see this movie besides having an answer to the question, would you trust a madman? Uh, come again, the line uh, not quite clear. Yes, I'm trying to find out why our listeners and some of your fans should actually go out and watch this movie. Well, uh, I would say The Madman, it's one of its kind. It's a resourceful movie that will, will enlighten and make us think and believe that uh, the, the people we are looking up to for help or for assistance are not normally the people who are famous people who are rich people who are influential in the society we should not limit our our uh, our minds towards getting favors or help from those people that are already made that have already made it believe in it that anybody can 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 be your helper just anybody so the madman talks about uh, how somebody is suffering and a, a woman Mamiche is lamenting because the son, who is asthmatic, a chronic asthmatic patient, is having a crisis. And she runs to other people, for, even up to the pastor, but no one could, could come to her aid. So she decided to back the child, and on the way, she falls several times, and people pass her by with cars, bikes, no one could help. But this madman that pirates the street, that roams the streets all the time, so so that um decided to mm. beautiful story so uh i could want to thank you so much for joining us on the show uh we'll definitely come back to this story when the film will be premiered so just before you go away just drop your contacts uh my contacts are let me start with the, the social medias uh ak and raf on facebook mm -hmm. uh, akuro rafael still on facebook uh 
Instagram is real AK and Ralph and Akoro real real AK and Ralph and Akoro Rafael on Instagram. I have two accounts on Instagram and Facebook. Mm-hmm. And uh Twitter is uh Akoro Rafael. All right, beautiful. And yeah, then phone number is uh six plus two three seven six seven eight four eight six eight two eight. All right, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll definitely be back with you. Congrats on the great job you're doing, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much, mm-hmm. and wish you all the best back right. in the studio. Thanks, bye. So, uh, Alina Asakwa, tell me a film like this, uh, where somebody has to play this role, should definitely be be, be hard to, to make. Mm. To play what? Well, I'm not understanding. Like a film where somebody has to play a role of a madman, it, mm-hmm. it, it, it should be hard to, 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 to put somebody in that kind of a character, I guess. Or it, is it easy? I mean, if you, if you do your homework, if you do your preparation, you kind of mm-hmm. have to study what a madman is or mm-hmm. who a madman is, what their character traits are, what they do, you know, how they do what they do, and... You know, you can't just show up to set and just be a madman. You have to actually do a lot of preparation prior mm-hmm. to that. It, it is hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It takes a lot of... All right. So uh, that is it. We'll definitely come back to that story. This is Fiesta number 99 and written from Apex One Radio. Maggie Daisy, uh, let's do some music and we see where to go to. We'll come back to Lily. Uh, all right. So we'll come back to, to her when we must have had uh, our next guest. <laughs>
time where you calculate me You calculate yourself, oh Cause I love you, I love you I love you, I love you And every time where you play me you're listening to Apex One Radio, specifically to African Fiesta. We're reaching you live from Columbus, Ohio on this day, April 6th, 2019. The show is hosted here in the studio by myself, Maggie Daisy and Kanjo. Mr. Enes Kanjo. We have here with us the one, the only, Lilis Asakwa. Lilis, welcome back to the studio. Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> so just before we went on break, you, you were telling us that you got into the New York Film Academy. Mm-hmm. What was that experience like? First of all, was it hard to get into that type of school? Um, initially, I thought it's a film school everybody can get in. Yes. Um, they had this page that's like a Facebook page, but only for people who are in the school or aspiring to get into the school. So when I first applied, I got accepted. So, But I wasn't excited because I thought everyone gets accepted mm -hmm. until um, I was seeing people who were posting statuses that they were rejected and asking, does anybody know how I can do mm. this? And I was like, oh, okay, so I guess people do get rejected from the <laughs> film school. <laughs> So while you were there, what did you study? Because when you go to film school, there is so much more than just acting that you can study. What was your specific area of study over there? So New York Film Academy is different. It's not okay. like a university or a college. For this school, if you go there for acting, you're there for acting. Mm. If you go for producing, you're there for producing. Because I love them, but they're trying to make money. So if you go there for acting, they'll introduce like a filmmaking class to you just for you to kind of see how filmmaking is yes. with them mm -hmm. to kind of make you want to come back and study filmmaking. So for me, when I went there, I went there for acting. So that's what I was primarily there for. They showed you a little bit of editing here and there, but yeah. um, it was mainly acting. Mainly acting. Yes. And so as an actress studying over there, prior to going to uh, New York Film School, had you been acting before? I had been doing in home <laughs> <laughs> is this where the village girl acting comes in <laughs> and you know i would have my friends that i went to high school with uh shout out to loy and sandra yeah loy would hold the camera sandra would act with me and sandra is an aspiring medical doctor mm. but i would make this girl act with me and i would get really upset if we set up a day to do something acting related and one of them can't show up it would make me really mad mm. they actually have the videos on youtube but i'm not sharing <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you to share those videos i'm sure our <laughs> listeners want to see them and so if you had been acting you know as an uh, amateur mm -hmm. what is it in film school that you learned that you didn't know prior to going in what was something that really surprised you when I was going to New York Film Academy, being that it is the New York Film Academy, I thought they were going to turn me into the next Genevieve Nanji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was very wrong. <laughs> when I got to New York Film Academy, mm -hmm. I got to learn that you cannot be taught how to act. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Mm, mm, um, mm. You either are born with it or you're not. Mm. You can... You know, it, that was just one of the main things that I learned when I got there. But you can fine-tune your, 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 your skills or talents, I guess. They show you how to go about, you know, making what you already have inside of you better. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they cannot pull you out of nowhere and turn you into an actress mm -hmm. or so an actor. So if you don't have the it factor, so inside to speak, you, you, don't, you, you can't make it. They, they, can't, they can't teach it to you. It's not... It's not teaching you how to draw blood. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. It looks like uh, our reporter in South Africa is on the line. Okay. Let's go to Johannesburg and uh, reach him. Then we'll be back with Lilith Sasakwa. But before Solomon Atta comes on the airwaves, let's listen to some music. Hey, hey, hey. 
Piece of music titled Question Me by uh, ADB. Music goes for the time to six minutes past 11 here in the studio of Apex I don't know what time is it in Johannesburg, South Africa. Maybe when Solomon comes on the airways, he will tell us. But Solomon will be focusing on music, where money from music actually comes, and just why musicians are so many these days with so many tracks being produced by the day, yet uh, the complaint that money is not coming in. And the money seems to be revolving around a few people, eh? Stanley mm -hmm. Eno, uh, Mr. Leo, Daphne, maybe Lo and it ends there. Yeah. Magasco, yeah, 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 it ends yeah. there. So, let me welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Emmett. Uh, welcome to you and to all our listeners across the world uh, to Johannesburg, hmm. uh, where the weather is very shy. I cannot see the sun in the sky, but it is a wonderful, absolutely fantastic day here in the city of gold, Johannesburg, which is also the largest and that's so earnest to the largest man-made forest mm. uh, in the world. We have a lot of trees here, mm -hmm. and the largest, the greenest in the world. Whereby, as I can tell you now, it being a Saturday, there's a lot of music artists out there trying to make a quick run. Right. Uh, right. I was going to add that uh, the land of the legendary Lucky Dube of blessed memory, while artists don't die, their music lives on. The land of Yvonne Chaka Chaka, the land of Miriam Makeba. Well, uh, so look, after these legends I've mentioned, Many other musicians have come up, and across the continent, we have so many young boys and girls who are popping up by the day with so many tracks. We've even lost track of uh, the number of songs that are produced on an annual basis. Yet, we are told that musicians don't have many anymore. So, tell me, uh, is it that the cost of music production has dropped? Reason why we have so many musicians coming up and so many tracks being produced nowadays. First question. Uh, thank you so much, Emma, for that um, question. I just also want to add that this is also the line that is blessed with a lot of musicians. We remember Miriam Makeda, also blended memory. Uh, a couple of days ago, in fact, Google and um, Honored our own view, Master Keller, who we have been 80 years old uh, two days ago. So, this is coming back to your question. So, South Africa is blessed with music. Uh, uh, just as everywhere else, uh, especially in Africa, the rhythms are uh, 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 big, the melodies and the voices. So, look, one would argue that the musicians coming up. Every day. The argument that uh, this report and that we want to make is that because of the advent of the internet, music that is supposed to remain either subculturally, which means that it isn't supposed to make its way into the mainstream until after a certain length of time, makes its way into mainstream and begins to sit side by side. Those that we can assume to be big artists. However, everyone that feels and that, um, that believes that they have a musical talent competes in the free market thing. Mm. Uh, and by this I mean they now have to use other channels. I can add, first of all, by providing their music for free so that people can be able to access it, and then secondly, by putting it on. Music down with such as iTunes, Shopify, Google Play, etc., etc. So, by doing um, we are in the old music are accessing music, not necessarily through a streamlined process from being subcultural or to getting into mainstream. But that even those that are subcultural music that are starting out are already putting out uh, um, music that is also consumed in this way. How they make money? Well, because the uh, landscape is now almost leveled, they could make money either from the downloads or they could make money from organizing smaller concerts, smaller gigs, smaller events or events that within which they are able to grow their audience. 
or I give the report of belief that in case the advent of the internet and social media is assisting or sort of um, a claim, a level claim to for all artists, they are in the market together and who makes it and who doesn't make it, it's up for understanding and it's up for arguing. And it's just because music, like other entrepreneurial activities, is also taken up as an entrepreneurial uh, venture whereby you can make it or you cannot make it. And it's, hmm. Uh, now, Solomon, you mentioned the different avenues on which uh, musicians can make money and the fact that we now have the internet available to us and we can access uh, music on there. But my concern here is the copyright. Why is there so much copyright today? Why is that such an issue? Thank you so much for that question. The, 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 the issue of copyright is almost a very blurred uh, it's a blurred environment. What's how do I mean? Uh, I don't think that those who, uh, um, well, that is a human discussion, but those that want to break into uh, the music scene uh, are concerned about copyright. Uh, my suspicion is that they are more interested in being recognized by the audience where uh, they can organize events, gigs, or concerts. And then where by these students will then pay. Another thing would be which is still again a substitution, but particularly based on any kind of research, is that they are the intention of putting out music out putting their music out there that they are in, is that they would in that process could be discovered by big record labels that could in turn find them. So I don't think they would be paid to buy, uh, especially especially because of this liberalization of some sort of the artistic environment due in part to their access to uh, um, how to produce music become much much more easier than it were when it was I ten years ago or fifteen years ago. So in this in this in this feedback, uh, I don't I don't believe that they still are described as parties that are at the subcultural level that are not really they must be recognized or that are not assigned to a record level are concerned with copyright. They are more concerned of, of accumulating what one could argue the social capital in that being known by a lot of people across the social media platform so that through which through the same medium they are able to bring these people to a place where they can go uh, and uh, uh, pay for concerts for various events or they could be signed up by a record level. Now, Solomon, if, if the record labels are not concerned with copyright and they're concerned with having uh, a, a, big, a bigger social media presence for their artists, should musicians or are musicians supposed to be poor when they have works that live on forever? Look, at this stage, I mean, uh, like, like I said earlier, um, the the, 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 the music scene is liberal. Everyone can go into a studio and can produce the music. My suspicion is that one could say the music environment, like various other industries, has to some extent been democratized, in that everyone sort of has an access to it. And perhaps um, it will be very easy. Only on the time, one could say, when these that cultural artists or this new artists or the ones at the entry level have made it to a point whereby they are now signed to a record level or they are now signed maybe perhaps within music organizations that they can now their music that was perhaps played on radio, especially in this country when copyright when copyright uh, is taken very seriously. They can now and from the money that they are assigned to a record level, even their previous work that were considered in the public domain, quote unquote, would now have to start attracting some copyright uh, 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 um, royalties to it. So it is a very, I want to say, it is a very, it is a very vague environment in which there is too much try and error and the, the, the interest to be signed by a record level, the interest in gaining social capital, gaining a lot of audiences. Something relevant on the social media platforms that have become a very uh, 
important aspect of, uh, of one's uh, um, relevance within a particular industry. So I don't think that uh, they, uh, especially the very, uh, the ones that country level, are concerned about copyright issues at this stage. They do. Solomon Atta is a senior analyst on Apex One Radio. He analyzes uh, virtually everything. Solomon, I want to thank you so much. We'll definitely come back to this topic for part two of it eh? because it's uh, so, 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 so vast. So thank you so much, Solomon. And definitely you'll be back with us next week. Thank you so much, Emmett. And I will be speaking to you. We are still election season in South Africa where we are going to be electing our president and electing members of parliament at the national level and at the professional level. So it is still electioneering, slogan, sloganeering about your pardon and all the, everything that happens in a vibrant mm -hmm. democracy of South Africa. And this is as a Solomon Atta in Johannesburg. Solomon Atta signing... <laughs> Out there from Johannesburg, South Africa, Solomon was talking about uh, the source of money in music. And of course, um, you got him. We'll be back uh, with that topic, which is quite sensitive these days. Apex One Radio, you're listening to Fiesta number 99N, reaching from Apex One Radio. Still to come, we listen to Sharon Dione in Limbe, who will be giving us a culture run up. Then we have uh, Sunshine Chinanzo, uh, who is an African actress who will get into her career as well. Then, the Ege show is uh, live, and we will be talking to its host, this edition of African Fiesta, just on Apex One Radio. Lili Sasakwa is back with us. He is our studio. <laughs> yes, so, uh, uh, Lili, uh, how much of music do you consume, and um, what kind of music do you like precisely? Is it a rap <laughs> thing? At least I like <laughs> rap music, trap music, gangster music. <laughs> Which one is gangster music? <laughs> I listen to a lot of violent music, and I'm the most peaceful person in the world. Oh like I don't know. <laughs> it just gets me hyped mm -hmm. and pumped up. You okay. Know? <laughs> All right, so uh, what do we do? Some music, then we come back to Lily's. So. Let's, let's get some music. All right, some so we'll be right back music. with you. Mano. Put the marks. Top class, first class. M M. Zantak. Promotion titled Maxi Max Lamu is the title of that song. The author is Maxi Max. The production company is Zontak Records. And that beautiful piece of music has brought a time to 20 minutes past 11 here in the studio of Apex One Radio. It's Fiesta number 99N. 
Reaching you from the United States of America this day, on April the 6th, 2019, it's hosted here in the studio by Maggie Daisy Ann. Mr. Enes Kanjo. And Lily Sasakwa is supposed to do this. Lily's welcome back to African Fiesta. Thank you, thank you. Now, be right before we took a musical break, you told us about going to New York's uh, film school. Mm -hmm. And your primary focus there was acting. Did you ever get to take a course in directing at all? No. Um, but we had a filmmaking class, which was like once a week for, I don't know how long that course even lasted, but... Um, it was just to kind of give us an idea of how general filmmaking is because mm. at the end of the day, actors are filmmakers. They are storytellers. They're just in front. Um, so that class, would we had to do like a short film that we would, you know, it, we were divided into two groups and then each group would assign their own director, DOP, producer, um, just take on different roles and rotate just so you can see what it's like to wear a different hat on mm. the film set. So mm. that was as close to directing as I got. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse yeah. me. Um, how long was your course or your period of study when you went to a New York film school? Nine months. Nine months. Yeah. And so transitioning from uh, uh, becoming a trained actor and doing movies post that, did you notice any changes with before going to film school and act, after going to film school in your acting style? Before going to film school, I was just mm. someone who wanted to be an actor. Mm. Coming from film school was someone who was even more confused. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <And that's it. laughs> it's like you come back out in school it's like you know you're going every day they're picking scenes for you to act with your scene partner you mm. come out of school and the world is bigger than you left it you're even lost now it's like you're in the real world and mm. you're like so mm. what next mm. but definitely when it comes to my acting skills I feel like I did improve they didn't teach me how to act because they can't but they taught me how to use what I have and work on my skills and yes. make them better and stronger but you have to already have that in you mm. yeah and so i i understand that you're also a, a writer be besides acting is that correct yeah <laughs> in, how did you uh, get into writing funny story <laughs> when i came back from new york like i said the world was bigger i was even more confused and more lost and being that the african film industry is a man no man thing yes i said it um i was when i first came back i was introducing myself to everybody i'm talking about if i see you with a camera i don't even know if it's someone else's camera you're just holding i'm gonna <laughs> introduce myself to you um but I felt like all of that networking was not going anywhere. Every yeah. day I'm hearing they're shooting a film. I don't know when auditions were held. Yeah. Um, so I kind of had to create an opportunity for myself. Um, that's how I started writing. I started writing by reading film scripts and scripts from short films that I had acted in. Um, I would follow like their formatting and then mm -hmm. started writing. And then now I can actually write on my own so even though i kind of shy away from that title as a writer but yeah. i do write yeah and, and so how many scripts would you say you've written so far i don't know i lost count <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> i've written a lot of mostly short films i have mm. a short attention span so i when i start a short script i can actually follow mm. through when i'm trying to do a feature length i've actually successfully done one feature learn from start to finish. Yeah. And and then it's a couple of them that I start. I'm in the middle. I get an idea for another film. I abandon that one, go to that. It's a habit I'm trying to fight, but you know. You're listening here live on African Fiesta, live on Apex One Radio. And in the studio with us today is writer, actress, producer, <laughs> Lilith Asakwe, our very own Cameroonian and uh, American based mm. uh, lady. Now, Lilis, we, we've heard about your work in the um, past. Let's come back to Lilis. Uh, we have uh, somebody on <laughs> the line. This okay. is our guest in today's edition of the show. This is African Fiesta number 99. And 
Sunshine, she knows what is our next guest. She will speak live from Douala. Okay, then. <laughs> Not Daphne, but uh, Gasha, Gasha in Gasha. Fake Love, Fake Love, beautiful piece of music which was released, I guess, last month, and it has brought a time to 27 minutes past 11 here in the studio of Apex One Radio. Let's go now to Duala, where our next guest will be joining us. Her name is Chinonzo Sunshine. She is a movie actress and makeup artist par excellence. Sunshine, Chinonzo, welcome to the show. Hello? Sunshine, welcome to the show. Thank you. All right. So, apparently, uh, we have issues. Uh, 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 while, while we're struggling to get uh, Sunshine back on the show, we can go back to our studio guest here, only live from Apex One Radio, mm-hmm. live from African Fiesta. It's Lilis Asakwe. <laughs> Lilis, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Are you having a good time so far? Absolutely. Always. <laughs> always. <laughs> We're always pleased to have you. Now, right before that break, I was talking to you about some of the movies uh, that you've done. And we know you've done a short death. Mm-hmm. Did you write and produce a short death? Yes. You did. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Now, so who directed it if you were the writer and, rep- and the producer? Uh, the film was directed by my good friend, Collins Imefile. He's from Nigeria. And so, what was your maiden short film? That was it. Um, it was. Yeah, it was. short death was. So, for people who haven't had a chance to see a short death yet, what is it all about? A short death is a super duper short film about um, just medical errors that can happen mm. and how we react to them and how humans basically always think the worst. Mm. So a short death, uh, my character actually also acted in a a short death. My character had um, her doctor just, just the way they delivered some news to her, she assumed the world was going to come to an end and she was freaking out and um, the end of the film was totally unexpected. So it's very short. You can even watch it and so where yeah. can we watch it if we were interested? It's on my YouTube channel. YouTube channel. Okay, Lilith we will get your yeah. we will get your social media handle at the end of uh, this interview. Now, after producing a, a short dead, what did you learn on there if this was your maiden production? I learned that filmmaking is not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that I still have a lot to learn about filmmaking. Yeah. And I learned that um, when we watch films, we are very quick to critique them. Yeah. But if you're ever behind the camera, and God help you if you're also in front of the camera, you will never talk crap about anybody's film. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And how long did it take you to produce this? It was such a super short thing. We shot it just that weekend. Mm-hmm. Um, it's only three characters, two mm. locations. Mm. Yeah, but he still told the full story. So, you're listening there to Lilis Asakoe, her first, uh, uh, her first short film called A Short Death, which deals with how information is transferred in, in the medical world. Lilis, we'll be back with you to talk more about your Once Upon a Wish yeah. short film. Is mm-hmm. a short film, yeah? Yeah. We'll be back with you to talk about that. But in the meantime, we will be taking a quick musical break. 
Jolo, jolo, beautiful Afro pop music there by Nigeria's Dantam, which has brought the time to 27 minutes to 12 in the studio of Apex One Radio. You're listening to the 99N edition of the show, reaching you from Columbus, Ohio, in the United States of America. The show is produced from Switzerland, precisely in the city of Vasuch, by Maxel Ajit, and he's doing that digitally. In the studio, we are two of us hosting the show. There is Maggie Daisy and Mr. Enes Kanjo. And our studio guest is Lily Sasakwa, producer of two short, beautiful films. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let the story continue, Lily. Lily, <laughs> welcome back to the studio. Thank you, Meg. And so, your maiden production, your maiden short film was A Short Death, mm-hmm. aptly titled. <laughs> and now, we move on to your most recent short film, Once Upon a Wish. Mm-hmm. That's a fascinating title. Um... Has anyone else commented about the title of the movie? Yeah. <laughs> I actually sh- suck with titling these films. I don't know how I came up with that. But um, especially when the flyer came out, the cover, mm. people would look at it and they're like, once upon a wish, what is she wishing on? What is she yeah. wishing about? Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that has been the reaction from people who've mm-hmm. seen the flyer. Yeah. What about the reaction from people who have actually seen the short film? What is the feedback that you've gotten so far? The most people have seen of this film is actually just the trailer. We haven't released it yet. Mm. Um I was planning on releasing it in, or we were planning on releasing it in April, but we didn't even pick a date yet, so... Yeah. Um, but the trailer, people love the trailer. Um, when we shot Once Upon a Wish, that's when I really felt like I was being a filmmaker as compared to A Short Death, because A Short Death was extremely short. But this one, I was dealing with 14 characters. That's cast and crew having to do scheduling and Mm. casting and location scouting. So that's when I 
were a real filmmaker. Yeah. 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 And, and with being a real filmmaker, uh, as you said, you have to work with so many of these people. What, what was your experience working with, uh, you know, some of the main characters? If you could present those characters to us mm -hmm. and tell us what your experience working with them was. Um, one of my... So how we did the casting was Colin Simefile, who directed A Short Death, also directed this for me. And I love working with him because... We are. We always see eye to eye. We're on the same page. So how we did casting was people would send in auditions, mm -hmm. and we both watch and then pick who we think best fits that role. Um, some of the main cast I had: Best Davis. If you were a Nigerian film watcher back then, you will know who Best Davis is. Mm -hmm. He's actually here in the states now. Uh, he played my dad in the film. Um, and Remy Momodu, who is also Nigerian, she played my mom. Um, and I have Simeon Danny Diamonds all the way from Minnesota. He came to Maryland for this. Mm. Yes. Mm. <laughs> and he had very few scenes, but very significant. We could not shoot that film without those scenes. So, mm. Mm. And uh, we had uh, my good friend from the New York Film Academy. She's in Brooklyn, New York. She came... Her name is Sheridan Duncan, and she played the role of Kimora. So, those and I played the role of Noella Fun, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, those are some of the main characters. And so, with this cast of people, what story were they trying to tell, or what message are you trying to pass across to the viewers of Once Upon a Wish? I think Once Upon a Wish, first of all, is a film about a girl trying to run away from her past. But there's really no difference between her past and her present. Mm. So she's still living the same life she's trying to run away from. Um, so trying to tell this story is just... And it's a thing about whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, and you watch the film, and you get to decide, are yeah. you really pro-life? Are you really pro-choice? And if you're pro-life, it's like, is there ever a point in which you can say, you know what, this person deserved to have had this abortion. Or if you're pro-life, you're just like, never. Beautiful. We'll come back to that. <laughs> there are signals that our reporter in Bamenda is on the line. One chance, Cynthia will be telling us about the, um, the fashion parade for women with disabilities, which took place last week in Yaoundé. She was actually MC of that event. And from Bamenda, she now joins us. Cynthia Wanta, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, uh, and it's been a while. I'm glad to be part of the show today. Beautiful. It's been a while. And last week, like I mentioned earlier on, you were coordinator of an event which took place in Yaoundé. Exceptional event because it had to do with women with disabilities showing off what they know how to do best on the fashion red carpet and uh, that is what actually happened. So tell us uh, what transpired and what was the objective of this event? Oh, okay. Um, it, it was actually a fashion uh, parade for um, women and girls with uh, disabilities. It was an opportunity or an idea born out of the desire to amplify the voices of um, women with disability and make them more visible. And it was equally a platform where uh, we creatively, or Sister Speak 237, that happens to be the organizer, uh, creatively used the platform to amplify the voices of women with disability on issues that uh, matter most. It was an event that uh, was to bring together close to 18 uh, women and girls with disability. We had um, 14 of them who uh, were selected from um, across the national territory, both Anglophones and uh, both uh, francophones, either women who were visually impaired, um, either women who have a mobility, and um, who uh, uh, were selected from um, uh, uh, the national uh, territory, uh, both anglophones uh, and uh, both uh, uh, francophones. Uh, uh, either women are um, exciting to see um, these women and um, girls beautifully dressed by four designers who partnered with um, Sister Speak um, to have them look as beautiful as they did on that day, and um, they used uh, one of the 
um, what to, 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 to tell the public about themselves, tell the public about the challenges they face as women and as girls with disabilities. I mean, there were pathetic stories that left people um, with a scary eye. In particular, was the, uh, the founder and coordinator of Sister Speak 237, who could not imagine that the excitement that she found um, with this uh, woman was actually going to accompany this event. And since after that event that took place on the 2nd of March 2019, the, the, the reactions, I mean, the post reactions have, have just been so overwhelming. We've had lots of national and international uh, media make contact to do um, post reports, just like what we're doing right now on Apex One um, Radio. I mean, in their own way, too, to amplify the voices of these uh, women, challenging everybody to always see inclusion in whatever decisions we make. And the challenge went most especially to the fashion industry. Because very little attention is always uh, uh, um, given to aspects of inclusion, and even um, with designers as well. So it was, it was a forum for um, these women, women and girls to remind these people that uh, they, even with their disability, they still are able to able to do this. There's even the recommendations to the organisation that it should be uh, an event that should be held, um, it should be held um, um, annually. It's the first of its kind that has been organized in Cameroon to have a fashion show uh, for women and girls um, with, with disabilities. And the reactions after that are just um, so fantastic and just so overwhelming. And um, the, the organizer feels or, or hopes uh, that um, Access 2019 is going to change the narrative of fashion show um, organizers and designers who have often or had very little um, when it concerns um, this, this class of women. I was able to catch up with the, co uh, the founder of um, Sister Street 237, that Comfort Mosa. We hopefully were going to be listening to her um, in, in a couple of in a couple of uh, um, seconds to get her post reaction and how she felt. You know, it was something she just shared one day that she would like to do a fashion show for women with disabilities. Which she did not see um, see this kind of uh, uh, feedback that she had seen that event held. Uh, one week ago. I think at this point in time, and then I'm going to allow the listeners uh, to be able to listen to the voice of the brain uh, behind Access 2019, which was uh, a fashion show for women and girls with disabilities. At Sister Speak 237, we organized Access 2019 in Yaoundé, Cameroon, as part of our activities for Women's Month 2019. And this year, we chose uh, a fashion show and a unique and creative storytelling session for women with disabilities because um, over the past five years, we've worked with different communities of women and persons living with disabilities and they have often described their experience as being um, invisible and unheard, especially in mainstream media, in different development initiatives, and in general life. And so we wanted to solve this uh, uh, challenge and meet a need to make women with vis uh, disabilities more visible and more audible in their stories they want to tell society. And so we um, used the, the fashion show. And uh, on the 30th of March in Yaoundé, we had uh, 16 women living with different ranges of uh, 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 disabilities on the runway. And uh, this happened to be Cameroon's first ever inclusive fashion show for women with disabilities. We had women who are amputees, we had women on wheelchairs, women with intellectual disabilities, women with hard of hearing challenges, uh, women uh, who are blind. And on the one way, we wanted to, to break the myth and stereotypes of people constantly thinking that persons with disabilities 
cannot add value to community life or uh, they are weak and helpless. On the one hand, we had women with disabilities who have master's degrees. Some of them are teachers. Some of them are running their own businesses. True, some of them uh, are currently seeking uh, employment. But this wide range of uh, uh, women from different backgrounds living with different disabilities and sharing their stories of triumphs sharing their uh, uh, challenges, but also proposing solutions uh, to what society can do to make uh, our communities more inclusive was really, uh, for us, uh, a fulfilling aspect of the evening. And after access, the response has been overwhelming. We've had parents who've called us. Uh, there, are, there are some mothers who've written to us to, to just thank us and say they had never imagined that they would ever see their, their daughters in such glory. And even there in the hall, it was a very emotional evening where many people would cry. And uh, it was also a very inspiring evening. And after access, uh, there, there's a media analyst in, in, in the country who, who say that access is probably the most widely covered event in recent times because the, the media coverage and the buzz around access has been wild, if I can, if I can say that. And it's really, uh, we're really uh, grateful and, and pleased that the stories of these women, uh, you know, has gone beyond Cameroon. The story has been reported on major international mainstream media houses. Their stories have been shared, their experiences have been shared. And this is what we wanted to do at Sister Speak more visibility and, and, uh, and amplification of the voices of these women. So uh, post-access, we are very satisfied with the results. We're satisfied with uh, the public uh, reception of this concept of an inclusive fashion show. We are also very satisfied with the level of engagement because people are talking about the stories and the experiences that the women shared. and. Look all right, that was uh, Komi Musa, uh, founder of Sister Speak, an advocacy organization which was uh, at the helm of the organization of a fashion show for women with disabilities which took place last week. And we will definitely come back to that story. Lily Sasaka, let me find out from you, how much of uh, women's advocacy issues do you get into? <laughs> are you, I don't want to use the word feminist because that is so hard, but are you one of those who advocates for the rights of the women to be respected? Um, I, I don't think so. Lilith, <laughs> <laughs> don't be strange. Lilith, <laughs> don't be strange. I, mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm an advocate. But okay. <laughs> so what are you then, Lilith Sasakwa? <laughs> mm. But I'm not an advocate, but I would tell women's story through film. So. Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Then. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Maggie Daisy? Mr. Kanjo. Mm -hmm. Yes, right on. Lila is suck. Lila, how are you enjoying your stint on FX1 Radio today? Beautiful, as always. <laughs> All right. I mean, if you want to go ahead and take this moment and shout out to some of the people who are supporting yes. you, that would be wonderful. I want to give a shout out to Simeon Danny Diamonds, who plays the role of Tobias, my boyfriend in Once Upon a Wish. I see you are listening. I also want to give a big shout out to Vanessa and Job Say. She, I love her. She's always so supportive of me and anything that I do film related. So thank you guys. <laughs> All right. Well, you can shout out more people as we go uh, ahead in the show. Now, Liz, you've been doing, or uh, you've done so far two short films. Why the interest in short films and not full length or feature films? Short films are easier. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I saw that I saw coming. <laughs> not only are they easier to shoot, first of all, they are easier to write, they're f easier to coordinate, easier yeah. to scout locations for. And also, another thing with working. Um, on l little to no budget films. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying these people, they're not going to call out of work to come to your set. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and mainly, 
working around people's schedules it's yeah. it's hectic so if you're gonna shoot a feature film you better have a budget that you can pay people out of their regular nine to five to yeah. come and work for you yeah. so yeah and so would you say you have in in the future plans to actually do feature films absolutely matter of fact the next two short films that i'm gonna shoot are about they're about to be my last for okay. a long period of time mm. i'm going to start taking the leap taking the jump into actually doing feature-led films mm. um mm. you have to you, ha you can't run away from that um you can't always do the easy thing or take the easy route so i'm actually gearing towards that okay and do you have any plans to submit uh, the short films that you've done up to date to any film festivals? Uh, uh, what you want to call it? <laughs> a short death? No. Okay. Um, that's already playing on YouTube. Uh, that would violate a lot of the um, the rules when yeah. you're submitting to festivals or things like that or TV shows and TV channels and stuff. Um, but Once Upon a Wish, we currently have it in Nigeria. Okay. Um, trying to see what we can do with it. But the process is so long. I'm getting impatient. My actors are texting. I promise you, every day at least one of them will text me, when can we watch the film? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm getting to the point where I'm about to be like, you know what, I'm just going to put this on YouTube. But yeah. I was hoping to put it on a platform where more people will be able to watch it because mm -hmm. it actually has a strong message. So, yeah. Now, let me take you back a, a bit to the cost of making these uh, short films. How, how costly would you say they've been thus far? Because we are not officially in Hollywood yet. Mm. <laughs> not officially in Hollywood yet. Miss. Not you are, yet. You, at least one, you are one step in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we are heading that direction. <laughs> okay. That's nice to hear, Lily. That's, that's the dream, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Dream. I mean, we got to shoot, you know. But since we're not officially there yet, in our heads we're there, but mm -hmm. since we're not physically there yet, mm -hmm. shooting short films in Maryland right now or locally is as costly as the people you know. Mm. Uh -huh. So since I'm a very social person, a lot of people, they'll, they'll come just to help you out. Um, some of them you will pay, but not as much as, for example, you know, Remy Mamudu, you will probably pay her more than I had to pay her because yeah. Yeah. she's someone I had networked with while I was still in school. So when I reached out to her, I thought she would be like, who is this small guest and she wants to shoot film? But <laughs> she was very humble and she reached out to me. She said, you know, I would love to come and support you. Mm -hmm. So they are as costly as the people you know. Sometimes you work with people who already have equipment so you don't have to rent equipment. Mm -hmm. You're paying them to come and direct and shoot. That's mm -hmm. one fee versus if you had to pay a director, pay a cinematographer, then rent equipment. So it's different every time depending on who you're working with. Beautiful. Uh, Lilies, we're going to take a break and listen to The Edge. And we will be back with you to, you know, talk a little bit more about your journey, talk a little bit more about your acting. So stay with us. Stay tuned here on Apex One Radio, listening to African Fiesta coming to you live on this day, April 6th, 2019, only from Columbus, Ohio. And it's uh, a production of Marcel Ajit, who said in the studio by two of us, there is Enes Kanjo Ayn. Maggie Daisy. Alphabetal Records. Salatial on the beat. Franchement, parfois on a besoin de se lâcher. Où sont les mamies? Où sont les papis? Rapidement, ça peut être pour ce soir, on va l'inio. Doucement, mamie, doucement, papi. Apprêtez-vous vite, les gars, tout le monde s'habille, on vient de commencer. Petit à petit, on s'approche de la nuit, on veut tout gâter. Apprêtez-vous vite, les gars, tout le monde s'habille, on vient de commencer. Oh. Petit à petit, on s'approche de la nuit, on veut tout gâter. Time to party, call on everybody. Bowling till the morning, so you tell somebody. Time to party, call on everybody. Bowling till the morning, so you tell somebody. C'est pas nouveau, nouveau, c'est pas nouveau. Y'a toujours des jaloux, jaloux, c'est pas nouveau. 
c'est pas nouveau, nouveau, c'est pas nouveau. Il y a toujours des jaloux, jaloux, c'est pas nouveau. On est avancé, avancé, avancé. Les jaloux reculent, reculent, reculent. On est avancé, avancé, avancé. Les jaloux reculent, reculent, reculent. Même dans la pluie, même dans la boue, j'arrête pas de chercher. Je suis comme poisson dans l'eau, je n'ai le mot, j'arrête pas de pointer. Dans la vie, on n'a pas de choix, il faut bosser. Quand on a un peu, on a peu des amis, ouais, on va faire au time to party. Call on everybody. Up next is some of us on the Egg Show. This issue, which has been on for some time now, and it's us who be getting us to try to hide. To tell us about this great show, which you can watch on YouTube, we will be speaking live from Texas in the United States of America. Do not go away. looking for a show to watch then the Ege show is right here but then let's listen to its uh, author and host first then we'll come back to it from text action now joins us nancy welcome to the show thanks for having me how are you today nancy i'm doing good how are you I'm all right, we thank God. And so we're speaking to Nancy Egeban. She's speaking live from Texas in the United States of America, host of the Ege Show. Once again, Nancy, you're welcome to the show. Thank you. Right. So, uh, for how long have you been running the Ege Show? Tell us. Uh, I would say uh, it's not quite long, uh, it's just about three months ago. And I started late December 2018. All right. So uh, how would you classify the Ege show and through what medium do you air it? Um, thanks for that question. Uh, it is a reality show. And um, and I talk about um, real life issues, uh, especially things that affect women um, positively and uh, negatively. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, it's not uh, true on YouTube. All right. Discuss the genesis of the Egger Show. How did it come about? Uh, you know, I'm just that type of type of a person who sees compassion in people's plight. Mm -hmm. And I've always amicable um solutions to problems that affect people's lives. Okay. So I found to talk about this issue. So I created the Egger Show platform to dish out information that stand on side of solutions to problems. All right. So when you were creating this show, what was your motivation? Okay. Um, actually, I talked to everyone. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, um, I mean, uh, I mean, I talked to, I, I mean, I thought there would be need for the first media. I mean, where people talk and desire could be mirrored. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they knew that they are not the only ones in their situation. Mm -hmm. um, that was it. Right. And what are some of the topics the show has had this far? Um, so far, I've handled topics on the, um, how to behave towards your neighbors. Mm -hmm. And um, I've also tried to encourage people um, not to develop the habit of quitting mm -hmm. because um, quitters don't win. And uh, another thing is. Um, what women want to hear from men. So, and amongst all, and, uh, other uh, motivating and uh, captivating topics. Wow, that's interesting. And what impact do you intend to have on the audience through the show? 
I want to uh, seriously, uh, I want people to um, change from wrong doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, want, I, I want to also encourage people who take positive, uh, positive steps. I want to um, consult people who find themselves in difficult situations. Stuff like that. Okay. And how is each edition produced from conception uh, through writing, filming, editing? Tell us how it happens. <laughs> I'm a funny one. Um, I mean, at this point in time, I'm feeling like a baby learning how to work and mm -hmm. eat. I haven't been uh, applying any professional tactics. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to uh, production, in fact, I think, uh, when I, the moment I conceived the idea, and I gave it a second thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also good on this test, and then I go for shooting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, it's actually interesting. We are speaking with the host of the Ege show, Nancy Ege Bang is live on Apex One Radio. She's speaking from Texas in the United States of America. And the show is African Fiesta. The edition is 99. And the hosts of the show, Ernest Kanjo and Maggie Daisy. Maxel Ajit is producing from Vasuch in Switzerland. So who are some of the people who, uh, you work with on the show? Um, to be honest with you, uh, I mean, at this point, in, uh, I mean, at this at this stage, I'm still trying to um, find co-workers and the production team, if need be. But uh, at this point, um, uh, I haven't found the need of bringing uh, in, in collaborator. Mm -hmm. So there are, uh, we definitely uh, need to find one, I mean, in future. All right. And what has been the feedback from people who've watched the show? What are they telling you? Um, so far, so good, and uh, I've had I've had a lot of positive and encouraging feedback mm -hmm. from a lot of my viewers out there. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. And uh, I mean, some even I mean, tense and I mean, we talk about a lot of positive things. Mm -hmm. At this boarding stage of the show, I would imagine that you have uh, some uh, challenges. What are these difficulties, and how are you going about with them? Uh, definitely, yes. There is nothing without challenges. I mean, um, sometimes I get even insults mm -hmm. from people, from people's comments. But I don't let those things bother me. Mm -hmm. I mean, another challenge is that sometimes, have, I, mean, I mean, another um, another challenge is that sometimes it is hard to get the desired number of views that you want. And they tell me, I get a lot of messages from people and, uh, I mean, from Australian motives and uh, many others. Mm -hmm. Wow. And where do you intend to take this show to? Where do we see it in the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, <laughs> the Ege show has come to stay. And my goal <laughs> is to talk so as, as possible so that... Um, so that I can transmit uh, my, message, uh, my messages of goodwill and mm -hmm. get uh, as many people as, as possible. The Ege Show has come to stay. Its host is Life on Apex One Radio, and she's speaking from Texas in the United States of America. This is Fiesta number 99. And so, um, what should we expect to see in the next edition, and when is it coming up? Um, actually, my, I mean, I, I, already, I already did one today. I already did a live show today, uh, mm -hmm. so this morning. So my viewers should uh, expect a midweek edition that comes out on Tuesday or Wednesday. So mm -hmm. I'll be and I'll be encouraging ladies. Um, I mean, also life easier. All right. So. The rendezvous is taken. Nancy, just before you go away, could you just drop your contacts so that uh, people who may like to work with you eventually may reach you? Uh, um, they can get me through the Egg Show, mm -hmm. um, through the Egg Show on YouTube, and um, you can get me on this phone number 972-370-8227. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 972-370-8228. All right. 
the message has definitely gone across Nancy Watu thank you so much congrats on the great job you are doing and we hope to have you back on Apex One Radio not too long from now thank you very much I do have a fantastic rest of the day out there in Texas. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm going to have a beautiful fire. I mean, I'll be having a nice day. No matter what. Bye. 